Paul. I saw a number of you coming in and I didn't know if I saw everyone, but I'm very thankful for all of you that have come. I did see uh, Matthew came on. And uh, so I know that means I need to get going. So uh, uh, at any rate, we're studying uh, the 11th of, in our series of a total of 20 sessions uh, to a Saturday. Um, and so today we're moving into a part of the history that is not recorded in any books that I know of. Uh, this is sort of a general collection that was made for a doctorate degree that I did uh, many years ago. I've updated it slightly and I've confirmed some things with people by phone and make sure that my facts were correct. And there's still a lot that isn't done uh, in this section, but what we're going to be doing is just we're going to be looking now at the independent Baptists and Bible churches as they came in between 1970 and 2000. I am going to talk to you about why I skipped over a, a reasonable period. Uh, I mentioned it a little bit last week, but I'll mention it again. And then I'll also be talking to you about the various forms of independent Baptist ministry that have developed. That's in the next section uh, that follows this one. We'll be looking at VIA, LMT, CMI, and so forth. So that will come in the next section. Next week, we will have an open question and answer session. And I really hope you will send in your questions and you can send in the answers too, if you like. And uh, I really appreciate that. And Cal and I will coordinate those questions and form that into a, a talk. Um, but it will be also that we can take some questions and answers uh, live on the uh, Zoom program. But most of it, most of the time, I plan on using to answer uh, questions that have already been received. I already have some. Uh, that I've received over the last few weeks. So those are going to get first priority. But as you send in your questions, please, this week, it will help us. All right. So then I want to review a little bit from last week because it's very important for you to understand what happened here in South Africa. Carl Bart, in 1950, I told you the story about how uh, Schaefer, Francis Schaefer, visited the renowned theologian at his home in Switzerland. There he asked Bart, did God create the world? Bart answered, God created the world in the first century AD. In other words, he's talking about spiritually and he's talking about uh, uh, you know, Christ and the influence of Christianity or some abstract sort of uh, answer that is common with neo-orthodoxy. Uh, anyway, Francis gestured out the window to the forested hillside and asked, this world? And Bart replied, this world does not matter. In other words, uh, uh, a neo-Orthodox person reframes everything in uh, abstract spiritual philosophy. There's no reality that they take into consideration. Modern thought presumed that religious truth and material truth consisted of two separate realities. And that became a real problem. Now, Schaefer spent the rest of his life dissenting from this view, trying to say that Christianity speaks of true truth, not this imaginary truth that they have on two stories. But at any rate, um, how does this affect South Africa? Well, it's very important that we understand that probably before 1945, going back even to 1905, uh, there was an increase in ecumenical activity uh, between uh, various church groups and religious groups. But following World War II, the pace of this picked up in a major way. And the whole idea of ecumenicity was openly discussed and the idea of uh, sort of uh, uh, cooperating and fellowshipping and working with one another became a, a standard feature of, of uh, the South African scene. This uh, had a really negative effect on uh, our whole 
situation here in, in South Africa. Uh, the churches that had been evangelistic became more uh, social minded. Uh, not that being social minded is wrong, but being socially minded at the expense of evangelism is wrong. Uh, if you want to do both, that's another subject, but to do one rather than the other, uh, definitely not on. And of course, the Bible teaches us in Galatians that we are to care for one another as brothers in Christ, and that we're to help those who have need among the Christian community. Actually, there's no mandate for us to take care of everyone in the world. And so there became a parting of the ways over what we'll call general social care, uh, which was meant to, <laughs> I think it was meant to uh, encourage, can I say, uh, a better attitude toward Christianity if we did more to uh, advance social causes. But I doubt that it really did that. But anyway, uh, some believed it did. So by 1945 to up to 1960, you have this uh, domination of ecumenism, neo-orthodoxy. And in the Dutch Reformed Church, for example, or the Anglican Church for sure, the takeover was pretty much total. And okay, it's, it's fair to say that, uh, it's, it's fair to say that um, probably the lay person, uh, the traditional churchgoer probably didn't understand all of this. So I divide the two figures or the two periods into two different sections, 1935 to 45, which I would call just outright ecumenical compromise, the initiation of memberships with the World Council and South African Council of Churches and all of that. And then the next period, which was more um, a period of political disorder. And of course, uh, that was part to do with apartheid and the rebellion against apartheid, and then the churches trying to react for it. And these churches being neo-Orthodox really didn't know how to react to it. So they took a political sociological answer as their answer because they didn't have a biblical answer. And so South Africa just went through a really dark period, in my opinion. Uh, it had been in uh, religiously in a dark period already because of apartheid. And now because of the open uh, rebellion against apartheid, there was this confusion about how to address apartheid correctly. And so it became the dominant issue of South Africa. And basically, missionary work, um, just if going along at all, it basically went along, humming along slowly, or modifying and adapting itself to sociology and psychology, um, leaving the scriptures behind. In 1974, we saw the first missionaries coming. They go back as far as 1970, really but the church was started as a Sunday, Sunday school uh, back in these days and, and became a church. So if we want to look at Jack Mormon uh, and his wife at, from BIMI, the Biblical, uh, Biblical Baptist International Missions International, I'll get it right. Um, uh, Jack uh, came uh, and established a church in his garage and um, I remember my family attending there when we arrived uh, in South Africa. And, uh, but he had been here working for some time to get it to that level. Um, and of course it continued to grow. Uh, and he uh, in time ministered uh, in other areas such as uh, England, but he did come back to Brackenhurst once uh, and then left again. So just to get us started with missions, we want to understand that I use Jack as an example of one type of missionary who arrived in the country as a church planter. I'll use myself uh, as a second example of that, uh, because uh, we would have had many of the same approaches, principles, concepts, and techniques as Jack would have had. 
And, uh, but we went up to Zimbabwe. He was down here in South Africa. Uh, now I worked with men like Stuart Waugh and Don Maitland and uh, Chris and Joyce Goffert who were with team and Nick Burtonshaw and others who came in afterwards after I left to take over Baptist Bible Church. So all of the men that I've listed there uh, were pastors of the church after we left in 1979. But uh, basically that church as an independent uh, church plant was very similar to the type of missionary work that Jack was doing and, and that I was doing. Uh, then we mentioned, uh, and I'll come back to some of these people like Chris and Joyce a little bit later, but we also had the Hillside Baptist Church in Harare, and uh, this was started by Kevin and Terry McGinnis, who actually were studying, they'd already graduated from college, but they were studying in some of the seminars and courses that I was offering, we became good friends. And um, he was there basically through 77 and to 79, uh, establishing that church. Mike Rudder, Ray Poutney, and others took the work. Then they left, and the church actually united with, uh, amalgamated with uh, Baptist Bible Church later. Uh, so then we go on uh, to Newcastle Bible Church. Uh, it's very important for you to understand this dynamic. This is a different kind of missionary startup. Uh, this is being started by Tom and Marilyn Wilson, uh, who had been with Worldwide European Fellowship, which became Biblical Ministries Worldwide a little bit later on. And um, it was planted there, but also pastored by a team with Tom and Paul and Frank Davis and even uh, Bill Hunter coming into the picture. So that was a real team effort there, but these people were basically getting their feet sort of wet in the new experience. Most of them had come straight out of, you no, know, all of them had come straight out of Bible college, except Frank Davis. Frank had come down from uh, Malawi, uh, where he and his wife had been ministering up there. Uh, Bill Hunter had a little bit more experience, uh, but only a few years. And, and so he and Dave Davis, Don Smith, who was interim, Dennis Emerton, Alex Cooper, all took on um, various uh, ministry over the periods that, of the coming 20 years. So just to come back though, and to talk to you about these men. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I wanted to update this and mention that um, Barry Springhall, who you all know, was discipled then and went to Appalachian Bible College in 1988 as the first member of that church to be trained for the ministry. Debbie, um, um, Mark's uh, uh, wife, uh, was single then, and Debbie went to the United States and trained in Christian service. That's where she met Mark Christopher, and she brought him back here and that's how they uh, came into the country. So just to give you some personal information about some of these people and their church roots back in these, this Bible church uh, ministry. Now, some of these churches had different names at different periods. Like sometimes it would be Newcastle Bible Church. Sometimes it would be Newcastle Bible Baptist Church. Sometimes it was Newcastle Baptist Bible Church. Uh, and then sometimes back to Newcastle Bible Church. So it, it did have its uh, variations in names. Basically, this type of Bible church is Baptist in principle, but uh, they would not necessarily stick to all the distinctives that Baptist might, in the case they might not be as strict about some issues of baptism, they might not see any special need to have one pastor as a lead pastor. They would more work as a pastoral team. So, you know, um, you can see that in other works, uh, community church works like MacArthur and others who have that system. Um, I think it's also used at, at Everglen here. Uh, Dave Rud Rudolph would have introduced it. So it, it's, it's around in different churches in different places. Um, 
but I wanted you to see these men coming in, uh, not from Baptist missions, but coming in with Bible church missions. Uh, and in this case, most of them coming from other countries like Frank and Bill and these others coming down from Zimbabwe uh, and Malawi and that type of thing. Only later did they come straight from America. These men were already missionaries. And as I mentioned last week, they were most of them either team missionaries or they were AEF missionaries who decided to leave that. But I'll talk more about that um, in the weeks to come. So I won't tie us up on that. In 1977, the Community Bible Church in Leandale, Johannesburg, Kaltang today, was planted by Mark and Wiley Grings, who'd arrived in 1976 from Zaire, Congo, and they were ministering under the auspices of IFM. And we'll talk more about the independent faith mission later. But uh, Mark and Wyla uh, were uh, the other missionary couple with us. We were also IFM missionaries. And so we had a lot of fellowship, worked together a lot over the years, especially between 77 and 79. Almost, not every month, but almost every month, I would fly down and teach uh, classes for Mark, uh, starting their Bible Institute and doing counseling because he had come from Zaire. He had a real understanding. He was born and raised in Zaire. He had a real understanding of the, the Zaire Congo um, uh, culture and language. Uh, he was adapting at first and he asked me to come down and help him make that adaptation, do some of the teaching of his men like uh, Oh, Alistair Butterworth, uh, Henry Davis, others that he was training. And um, uh, he was carrying on the bulk of the work, but I would just come down and, and, and feed into that picture. Um, and so we, we were a real team. And uh, even sometimes we had birthday parties together uh, because it was just a chance for our children to get together. All right. 1978, the Baptist Bible Church in Chesapeake, Salisbury, uh, began, had, had already started, of course, back in the early 76 period, but was now buying property, was the first independent Baptist with a missionary apprentice, Kit Fearson, was the first college seminary student serving as a missionary apprentice. And he came out for a limited number of months of training and ministry. I mentioned him because uh, after him came literally more than two dozen more college students and other types of trainees uh, in our lives as missionaries, not only to us, Judy and I, though at least more than a dozen of them came to us, but they were coming to many other ministries. And so that's been one of the important ministries we have had in the past and I would certainly encourage you to do that again, because it provides you with a missionary who will come back like Kit did, who understand the culture they're coming to, who understand the doctrines of your churches, your conservatism, and they would only come back if they agreed. So, so it allows you to filter out uh, people who disagree uh, with you in your principles or your teaching. So it's a really great opportunity. Plus, you can have a great role in people's lives. Um, 1979, the Kempton Park Bible Church was started by Frank Davis of WEF, uh, BMW. Uh, he had left, uh, he'd been up in Zimbabwe. We worked together up there for four years. He also was in my uh, courses on counseling and some other pastoral the courses that he felt he hadn't had um, in uh, America. And uh, we just became great brothers. We were good bowling partners. And uh, uh, so we had times where we'd meet each other in different cities just to go bowling. Uh, and I'm talking now about 10 pin bowling. Sorry for those of you who are grass bowlers. Uh, anyway, in 1980, the Kempton Park uh, Bible Church in Kaltang, which had been planted by Frank, was now placed under the oversight of church planting missionaries Paul and Joan Seeger. 
And this was a, a major turning point in uh, everyone's direction, but certainly Paul and Joan led the church into some new areas. One of the things they did is begin training leaders. And a church that's not training leaders has no future. I, I wanna say that again. If you're not training your teenagers and you're not having uh, teenage discipleship times, if you're not inviting some of your older teenagers to even come to your leadership courses, if you're not having leadership courses for your deacons, potential new deacons, and possibly evangelists and uh, Bible study teachers and preachers, if you're not doing that, then your church is already going to date itself out of existence. And it, because you do not have the denominational backup like the Baptist Union would have of propping you up. So if your church does not do that consistently, you can date your church at somewhere around 30 to 40 years, it will cease to exist or it will cease to be effective, let's say. Uh, 1981, the Freeway Park Baptist Church in Boxburg started a brand, uh, as a branch work of Brackenhurst. Sorry, I said started a branch work. It was as a branch work of Brackenhurst Baptist Church. This work was planted by Gerhard Vandenberg, now in Walvis Bay. Um, in 1985, Alistair and Pam Butterworth, uh, coming over from Mark Green's work, um, uh, took the pastorate that was later amalgamated with Kempton Park uh, Bible Church. Then in 1981, the Community Baptist Church in Westville North, uh, uh, Natal, was initially planted by Judy and I. We joined uh, soon, um, I think it was a year and a half or a year later by Dale Marshfield. And the first pastor of the church was Richard Monden. Um, and uh, Richard is an architect, but also uh, has um, serious uh, illness that has kept him from going on in the ministry. Rob Elkington came as the next pastor or really overlapping Richard. But then Rob went to Canada and uh, the church went through uh, a number of changes, which I think I discussed later. Uh, other early missionaries uh, to uh, South Africa uh, and to the, um, the general uh, region around uh, Transvaal was Joel Baines, Charles Hoblitz, Ken Eubanks, and Bob Johnson. Now I knew all these men and uh, I would say were acquaintances, but their ministries, which were very much supportive of other works, like um, uh, they were very much involved in helping other ministries get started, um, was generally not resulting in a, a church. There's one exception, and that is in Hillbrow, where they all spent quite a bit of time working in those areas. And uh, so, that sort of gives you the history of those men. Joel's passed away, by the way, uh, but I'm still in touch with his uh, son. So we uh, thank the Lord for these people uh, and their ministry. Gethsemane Bible College was at the core of what these men were doing at that time uh, in Johannesburg, established by Jack Mormon and Lou Finney and Roger McCrum in the early days, Joel Baines. Uh, w. St. John, John Tyner, Paul Seeger, Mark Grings. This was a non-accredited, traditional, American-style Bible college built to a great degree around the styles of the early styles of Moody Bible College, the Schofield Bible Course. Sorry about my spelling mistake. And modeled on curriculum of Tennessee Temple Bible College as well. So it was a, a mixture of these things and ideas, uh, but was was very uh, effective and trained quite a few men. The CMI ministry in Johannesburg began primarily because there was not an agreement between Gethsemane and, and, and some of the other men uh, like Paul and, and like, um, let's see, well, Mark was okay either way. I think um, it had a lot to do with Paul. Uh, uh, not being committed to King James only and not necessarily 
using the type of street evangelism that was promoted by Lou Finney and some of those fellows. So I've been out doing street evangelism with them. I know exactly what they did. I've done it with them uh, right downtown Johannesburg and in other uh, centers of suburbs. And, uh, and this was the approach they used. Track distribution was another. Paul was more interested in developing a less uh, uh, sort of uh, what he would have considered a, a more relational type evangelism approach. And, uh, and of course, I agree with him. So we were involved uh, uh, with him. Um, and I, again, came up quite often uh, in the training program in the early years. Uh, Peter Thomas, Dennis Emerton, uh, now, Barry Springhall is in there, but he actually went to Newcastle Appalachian. He, he started, he was approved, but he decided to go to Appalachian. And uh, so it was our loss, his gain. Alex Cooper, Alex Surf. By the way, uh, just to let you know, Barry's cancer has uh, started back up again. Uh, and so we ask prayers for Barry again and, and for his ministry. But back to others, Alex Cooper, Alex Surf, Chris Lambert, uh, Sean Surf, Peter Engelbrick, Daniel Warren, uh, part-time lay preacher evangelist students like Brian Cowes, uh, Dave Coe, Robert Warren, and Lee Gates, and others. There was just quite a crew that were being trained in those days uh, through the CMI Johannesburg, uh, led by Paul Sager. And so we're very thankful for Paul's ministry. Uh, other men like Mark Rings and others uh, continued with Gethsemane, but also had some involvement with the CMI as well. Moving along, because I have a lot to cover, I've, I've got to 20 some years to cover or, or more. Um, we want to go down to Natal to New Germany Baptist Church in the Durban area. Stuart and Laverne Wall came down and joined with the Independent Faith Mission. And uh, 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 that they had recently joined and they started to work there. And we were again involved together. Uh, it was a team effort. We'd go visiting for each other together. So we'd have two of us to go together. And so that was very much our ministry at that time. Uh, just two couples working together. Richards Bay Bible Church was planted also by Bill and, and Joy Baxter and their two children. And he now pastors in the United States. We're going to hear about him one more time, though, before he went to the States. The Jelinas and the Davises followed in Richards Bay, uh, but in a slightly different ministry approach. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, in 1983, Grace Baptist Church in Queensboro was started by CMI student Henry Davis, uh, one of our earliest students, but who really came from Mark Grings. He had been trained uh, in Mark's ministry, he had been led to the Lord in Mark's ministry, and then came to us to get further training uh, that he wanted the, the, um, the, on, uh, the hands-on uh, approach that we included. And so myself and Dale Marshfield were primarily the ones teaching at that time and were involved in starting that work uh, using Henry. Uh, Henry preached on Sunday mornings, um, almost all the time, uh, certainly after the first six months. And uh, we tried to use Henry and then Dale and I did backup preaching and that type of thing. Uh, then Reservoir Hills Church was reconstituted by Pastor George Moodley. I'm in contact with that church uh, uh, ongoing and their new pastor. And, uh, but uh, that was a Pentecostal church and uh, has an interesting story. And uh, in brief, it's just the story that George Moodley contacted us, he and his wife, Pat. Uh, they contacted us, said they had questions about this charismatic movement that they were a part of because they'd heard a cassette tape that questioned it. So I invited them to our home and every Monday they would come for tea for about a year. And, uh, and we just taught and answered questions and got into the scriptures. And then one day he had told me that uh, he'd like me to come and preach at his Pentecostal church. And I said, well, that could be complicating a little bit. 
And he said, well, what about Sunday night? And I said, well, I don't know if I'll agree with all your music. So I'll, I'll do my service first and I'll come to yours. And that way I'll miss the music and, and I'll feel a little bit better about that. And uh, so I went there, I preached on First Corinthians for, I don't know, six or eight months. And afterwards the church voted to become an independent Baptist church and literally has become that type of a church all these years. So it's unique, different story of George and Pat. George went home to be with the Lord. He had a heart attack uh, a number of years back, uh, but Pat's still doing well. We uh, thank the Lord for their faithfulness. Uh, then also there were other churches starting at the same time around 85. Uh, the Clarks, Carl and Bonnie uh, started the uh, Bible Baptist Church in Peter Marisburg, but, but there were other ministries they were involved in uh, outlying. Then Fellowship Baptist Church by Dale and Karen and Marshfield uh, was also started. Uh, the McClure family uh, joined with them. They were on the North Coast, and I don't know that it hasn't changed names, but at any rate, um, uh, Nick and Vic Willis took over that ministry. And uh, uh, they were, uh, well, uh, that, that's an interesting story. They were in our briefly in our youth group up in Rhodesia when he got out of the army and was led to the Lord up there uh, in um, uh, Rhodesia, as it was then, and then later came down, was trained by Dale, and uh, became the pastor of that work. Uh, so then there was a North Coast Baptist Church planted by Ennis Pepper out of um, Jacksonville, University Baptist Church, Jacksonville, Florida. So he was sent by a particular church, but he had a Baptist Bible Fellowship background and still maintained uh, Baptist Bible Fellowship links and philosophy, but was a good friend of ours. And uh, in the early days before they started the church, uh, they attended our church and we had great fellowship and, and uh, so forth. Um, in 1987, the South Coast Whitfield Park Natal Team Church uh, planting ministry started under the Morris and Jelina families. That goes on today. Uh, and um, I think the Morrises are still in the country right now. Um, obviously they do go back on furloughs and I know he's like all of us nearing retirement age. But Dick he's Jelina, retired now. He's gone back okay. to the United States. Thanks Mark. The Jelinas, uh, Dick Jelina passed away of a heart attack a few years ago and uh, is home of the Lord. Uh, his wife, I believe, has also passed away. Um, in 1988, uh, in Gauteng, we move on to Santon. The Santon Bible Church was planted uh, by Paul Sager. Uh, he was really still doing some work at Kempton Park, so he was doing double duty uh, and we had a lot of conversations about that and but he did for a while and and then uh, Pete uh, Thomas took over the work uh, at Kempton but I'll mention that later and uh, so a great ministry an exciting ministry a uh, very effective uh, outreach that Paul and Joan had then back in Westville in Natal the Community Baptist Church uh, uh, called Richard Mondin to be the first pastor. Judy and I moved to Cape Town. Um, so now we're back uh, into the uh, Cape area a little bit now. Uh, I've been roaming all around uh, South Africa and I really left a lot of other places out. I apologize, Mapumalanga and other ministries up in the Northern Transvaal. Um, but I've I've had to limit what I do to what I actually knew. And I did send letters out to a lot of these men over the years asking for more information, but that wasn't always forthcoming. So I've had to build with what I could uh, obtain. Uh, so in the Rhonda Bosch Newlands area, John and Penny Jackson came and were church planters with a new spelling. Uh, this church relocated and evolved into Grace Baptist of Tableview today. Numerous missionaries would add their contributions all through Evangelical Baptist Mission, uh, which um, has ceased to exist as a mission, but it was in, in Indiana. I'll talk about it in the next session. 
Um, today, Pastor Barry Springhall, that I've already mentioned, is the pastor, and many of you are assisting him. I talked to him yesterday, and he was telling me about the different ones of you who are preaching for him, and, and that's a real blessing to him, especially now that his health is um, under pressure again. Uh, in 1988, same approximate time uh, that John was here, Bill Mayer and Roger McCrum arrived uh, in Somerset West. Roger was there just for a relatively short time, and they started the Macassar Baptist Bible Church. I believe it was started in the garage of a family that he was uh, a captain of a fishing vessel uh, out of um, out of. Uh, Cape Town, or maybe it was out of Hout Bay, I think, and um, uh, and that's where they met in that garage. And uh, I remember getting to attend that toward the uh, a later period, about a year later, uh, I think, when we attended there. And uh, so the Lord uh, blessed that work, and vision and action was involved in that work. But I'll tell about that later. In 1989, uh, in Durbanville, Cape Province, the Everglen Baptist Church was established with Dave and Julie Rudolph, uh, meeting first in home Bible studies, then down at the uh, um, uh, high school. Um, okay, Mark, you can help me with that name too. Um, and uh, uh, so they went into their own building only a few years later. I'm, don't have those figures right in front of me, but at any rate, um, the uh, the uh, ministry was really a, an effective and, and, a, and, a, and a, a growing ministry right from the beginning. Um, the Malibu Village Community Baptist Church was started by Dave and Anita DeVore in a unique sort of team ministry with other ABW missionaries like Dave Rudolph and myself and some of the student pastors who were involved back in those days. I, I don't know if Mark, I know he was a student pastor about that time, so I don't know if he was training, but he might have been involved in that. And there were others that were involved uh, as well in that period of uh, the starting of that work. And some of you who are listening right now know the history of that church because you, you are the history of of that church, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, so then um, I'm going back up to Johannesburg a little bit for this period because the Calvary Baptist Bible College was established in uh, 1990, and so and it's still going today, and in various forms. It's gone through a lot of different forms uh, over the years. Uh, so all I all I can say is that. Uh, 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 it's been very active and, uh, and is active today. Uh, in 1990, the Brackpen Bible Church with uh, Bill and Joy, Joy Baxter uh, came into uh, being. And I think I mentioned the, the Baxters uh, had been in uh, Richards Bay. Now they were starting a work in Brackpen. And uh, then after that, they went to the United States. He was called to become the pastor of the church that sent them in the first place where he was raised as a young man. Uh, their pastor uh, retired. I knew their pastor. This was uh, all in Vallejo, California, you know, outside of uh, San Francisco, a ways maybe an hour and a half drive. And um, then um, uh, at the same time, that this was taking place uh, down in Durbanville. Judy and I were starting Tigerberg Baptista Comienta, and then Bryant and Sharon Crane joined us uh, as soon as they could get there, literally. And so we formed a team there. Uh, then the Westville Natal Community Baptist Church added Rob Elkington. I think I mentioned that um, together with uh, Reverend Richard Monden, but I don't know if I gave you a date, but there's the date that that, that um, took place of the addition of Rob Elkington together with Richard. Uh, I believe Richard, uh, Richard had Parkinson's uh, diagnosed, and so that led to that. In 1992, uh, Kempton Park, uh, Kempton Park Bible Church, uh, uh, became uh, 
uh, autonomous and was pastored now under Peter Thomas. And so that was another special day in all of our lives. And uh, uh, we're thankful for that ministry. 1993, the Grace Fellowship in Pretoria, a MacArthur ministry was uh, begun. And in that same year, a splinter group, a uh, first splinter group I'm aware of, uh, left Community Baptist Church in Westville over a debate regarding temporary music and joined the nearby New Germany Baptist, which they'd always been involved with anyway, uh, through Stuart Law and such. Um, and now uh, that work went on under Commissioner Steve Thomas and uh, uh, who followed Rob Elkington to lead that half of the congregation that, that stayed in Westville North, um, where the other people moved over to the New Germany church, uh, roughly about a 20 minute drive away. So uh, those churches went on in that form. And, and then finally, the um, Westville work was closed. It was dissolved a few years later. In 1994, Newlands Bible Church, uh, which was um, in Cape Town, was started by Mark Christopher. And uh, some of you, maybe even some listening, uh, would have been involved or know all about that um, in some detail. In 1995, in Primrose, Kyle Tang, uh, Joel uh, James, uh, started a ministry under the MacArthur Ministry System. And it was an independent church. It was a Bible church, um, but obviously um, not necessarily of the same exact ilk as ours. And we'll talk about that in the next session and in the Q&A next week as well. Um, back to Richards Bay now. The Bible church was struggling. And it uh, sort of absolved itself, but it was the basis of starting the Calvary Baptist Church. So it just sort of morphed into the, the next stage, as I understand it, at least. And that's uh, where Dick Jelina was there then. And then later, uh, Henry Davis left Queensboro uh, down in Durban and came up and took that work uh, for many, many years. Uh, in 1999, the New Germany uh, um, ministry reached into KwaZulu Natal uh, through the Johnson Ben Zulu ministry combination uh, that took place. And uh, there's a work there today, but it's not exactly the same group, but it, it exists today uh, under uh, a uh, gospel, I think it's gospel, independent gospel mission uh, out of Pennsylvania. Uh, is, is operating there uh, through that same sort of link from New Germany Baptist. Um, then in 2000, Cape Town um, uh, had Blue Downs Baptista Comienta started by Mark and Nancy. And at the same time, part of Berg Mountain Retreat uh, had its initiation through uh, purchasing of the property and having our first uh, camp and that type of thing in a tent. Uh, on the property. And uh, so those are sort of the picture of, uh, of the growth that I wanted to emphasize up to 2000. We're going to go further, but only in later sessions. All right. So I'm going to hand this back to Cal. I think I've left you at least five minutes. Uh, I've lost track of my time a little bit. So Cal, you'll have to control the, the Q&A for this, if you would. Please. Okay, thank you, Pastor Mark. Anybody got any uh, questions, observations? Uh, Mark, I'll give you the dates so far as Rhonda Bosch is concerned. You know, you have, um, it started. That, that, than that'd, be, that'd be nice. If you'll send that to me, I'll update it in one of our future, future QA. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I reworked the uh, foundation formation of that church. It, it started I know you were. Yeah. yeah, but I. Probably uh, took my data from whoever, not you. Yeah. yeah. Good. Thanks for that. Um, and any anyone else that has some updates, uh, send them to me, please. I'd love to have them. Also, yeah. Macassar as well. Uh, Macassar Ministry as well, because I was also involved with that right at the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Anything you want to send me on that, you're welcome, and I'll 
try to update that, surely. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, Mark, I've got a question. There was a man called, um, I think his surname was either Wilson or something, but he went down PE -E way. Um, has he been involved in, in, in the church planting efforts in Joburg up in the time when you were there? Um, can anybody help me um, with the name I'm thinking of? But he, he started some, well, at least one church, and that church supports some of us. So they called um, Grace, um, I think they called Grace Bible, was a great Baptist, but they think he, Walmart, I think his son was Walmart. Larry Walmart. Yeah. Yeah, it, it comes a little bit later. The reason it's not in there is it, it doesn't it doesn't go back that early, I don't believe. Uh, so I, I think you'll find the PE and some others uh, were branch works uh, of um, South African churches using South African men together with some missionaries who joined them and that kind of thing. But it was a bit later, I believe. I might be wrong about that, but that's what I understood. And if you guys know any facts about these little areas, don't be shy. Send them to me. I'll check them out. I'll add them in. I'd be glad to update it. Yeah. What I've tried to focus on, though, is basically ministries that I knew were a part of Bible church missionaries or Baptist missionaries that I could identify uh, what mission agencies they were with. Uh, I, I believe the PE work has gone through at least three different mission agencies uh, helping it along uh, yeah. different times. Yeah, and I, I don't have their whole history, but if somebody gives me the phone number of the current guy, I'll call him and get it. it I'm not shy, you know about how shy I am. So anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other observations, Thanks. guys? <clears throat> uh, I see Charlie has a question. He wants to know about Pope Pastor Tony and Kathy Payne in Istanbul. They come later in the story as well. Um, um, and uh, so, yeah, we'll talk about it later. Yeah. Good, they sir. do Thank come. You. They come for, they, I do mention their mission in the next section. So I'll start talking about them in our next uh, hour. Yeah. I didn't realize that you had known Pastor Kit. Pastor Kit came, led me to the Lord. When I think of him coming to knock on my door one evening and telling me about Jesus, I, I, I praise the Lord for that. And he started talking to me in Afrikaans. And I thought, here's a man from Alaska talking Afrikaans. Yo, and, and to witness Pastor Tony Payne learn to speak Afrikaans. What a privilege, sir. To know these men was, was, was an awesome experience. Um, yeah, it was an amazing blessing. I'm thankful to Pastor Kit. Well, I blame Tony for any problems I have with Afrikaans because he and his <laughs> wife, uh, he and his wife and Judy and I studied Afrikaans together at the beginning. So any anything that goes wrong in Afrikaans, yeah, I'd happily, maybe, as long as my wife's not listening, I'd, I'd blame him. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Yeah. Now, we, we know these folks uh, down through the years and their ministries, and Lord's blessed them. Uh, indeed, Kit, indeed. Kit we've, known, we've known Kit since 1970, I think it was 78, yeah. Amen. All I can well, say about he, him, And by the way, he's, he went back and pastored the same church that sent him in Alaska. Their, their pastor re, uh, retired, yeah. just, like, just like the Baxters did. The same thing, Go, uh, going back, you know. Uh, Kit and Joy arrived in about August 1986. Yeah, okay. because we got, yeah, we got married in 87. And it, uh, we were married for a few months. And then Kit came knocking at our door and shared the yes. gospel with us. And so, yeah, uh, I'm extremely thankful to the persons. I, I think yeah. if you talk to Mark Blackwell, uh, um, he will also tell you that uh, he did a lot of visitation with Kit. I think they were like a, a team sometimes. Yeah. But anyway, uh, that was during Mark's right. student. Day. Yeah. Well, when I came down, um, yeah. I came down in 87. Um, okay. I think it was 87. Maybe it was 86. It might have been April of 86. 
and I came down and um, and worked with him for two weeks, uh, just as like an internship. Um, mm. And uh, I remember him going to Macassar Boys to, um, and uh, and some other places like that as part of the for visitation. They were meeting out of their garage at the time, mm. and. Yep. Um, mm. Yeah, that was that was uh, very good. And then when my wife and I came back and ministered, um, he and his wife were also quite an encouragement to us. Amen. Actually, they were an encouragement to anybody that knew. Yeah, they were great. Can, I, can I share a quick story about Titius? And he used to come and pick me up with his motorbike when we went to Everglen for our monthly CMI meeting. <laughs> the kid was a rough rider. I tell you, mm. that guy improved my prayer life. I shouldn't know. <laughs> he would wait yeah. for me outside with his with his yeah. He would hardly give me a chance to get on an old auntie, and then he would pull away. You know that that kid. <laughs> and yeah, he was a good man. Yeah, kid and I talked about our strategy for giving people a uh, stronger faith. <laughs> because when uh, I met uh, when I met uh, Dave Rudolph, uh, the way Dave Rudolph came to our youth group back in Rhodesia was I would pick him up on my Vespa, hand him a helmet, and take off. And uh, and these guys seem to come to the Lord and find faith a lot quicker than the rest of you. <laughs> so if you want to improve, if you want to improve your faith. Uh, I'll take you for a motorbike ride. Uh, and it might even, at my age, it might even give you entrance into heaven rather sooner than you thought. So, yeah. So, yeah. There, there was a time when Kit was busy doing a, a work in Kyolicha. I don't know if you guys remember. We tried yeah. to do something there. And the cops had to basically stop him and tell him, sir, it's too dangerous for you to come in there. And uh, he, he was that, he was that daring. He was just a crazy fellow. Yeah. But I'm thankful for him, but it's because of Aubrey that I became a believer. You know, and Aubrey was one of his disciples, and yeah. yeah. So, yeah what a, what a blessing, man. eh? Yeah. Indeed. Well, I'm going to uh, let Cal give us a break now. Uh, so we'll take a, just a five-minute break. And all right. So uh, we are just been looking at what I call a resurgence. Now, one of the things I explain as a review of the previous time, I refer to it as a resurgence because I'm thinking of the, the great surge that took place between 1870 and 1930 of conservative Bible-believing, dispensational, millennial teaching, uh, Schofield Bible-toting Baptists who were making up the Baptist Union at that time. And uh, also uh, much of that dispensational taught that uh, teaching that was even being taught uh, in the Dutch Reformed Church at that time. So the resurgence I'm talking about is this uh, coming alive again of conservative Bible believing, Bible preaching uh, churches, be they under the name of Bible Church, be they under the name of uh, Baptist Church. Uh, and yes, I have skipped over the ministries of team and evangelical, uh, uh, Africa Evangelical Fellowship, AF, uh, because uh, none of us were in a direct relationship to those ministries, but they did exist very effectively between 1950 and 1970. They started to wane uh, in the 1980s. Uh, uh, but they're still uh, to be found. And uh, so uh, they are another subject. We have talked about them briefly, uh, and we will talk about them again just now. So we're looking now at a different subject, and that is the different forms of independent Baptist. I, I find a lot of people find it very hard to understand this idea of the independent Baptist. And between 2001 and 2015, there was a great expansion, and a lot of this expansion was due to the forms of Baptists that took place. And so what we're going to do, we're going to, first of all, look at the mission agencies that were from the very beginning involved, and then I'm going to go on 
and I'll talk to you about the uniqueness of the cape here. And that's probably going to take up all of our time. So let's go back and, and just look at this list and let's talk about it. Now, this isn't everyone. Uh, the BMW missionaries, biblical ministries worldwide, at first were formed from team missionaries and AEF missionaries who left team or left AEF and joined uh, either uh, Missionaries for Christ International under Repke, or they joined WEF uh, uh, as Missionaries International was absorbed into WEF, Worldwide European Fellowship. And this then was amalgamated into what became Biblical Ministries Worldwide. Now, the, the WEF uh, mission was uh, a European mission, uh, very active in Amsterdam, very active all throughout uh, the Netherlands and Belgium and Luxembourg and other places. And the director of that, uh, uh, um, there was two different directors of that ministry, were both men that um, I was with at the Fundamentalist Congress in Singapore in 1980. So uh, actually one of them was uh, my roommate in the hotel that we were staying in. And so we, we've known these men and we've had these connections way back. And many of them are linked, uh, the, especially the Worldwide European Fellowship men are linked to Bob Jones University or, or some very conservative uh, schools like that. Um, when, it, when they continued to integrate, they integrated more with Appalachian Bible College. Um, and so Appalachian became the dominant force uh, in the future. And then other men started joining from other college backgrounds over the years, especially when Paul Sager left here and became the director there. Paul's now retired and they have a new director. But uh, the, that period is, is an amalgamation of conservatives coming out of all sort of different backgrounds from Malawi, Rhodesia, um, coming from uh, 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 Namibia as well, a couple, uh, coming down to uh, South Africa, of course. And uh, so they represent the two missions, team and, and, and uh, AEF that I've overlooked. Uh, but certainly I don't want to slight team or AEF during the 50s and 60s, early 70s, it was a very effective ministry. We've talked about it already being very strong in Natal and Johannesburg, but it's also very strong here in the Cape in its history. So Bible colleges in every major city. So they, they uh, had a real ministry. Then I move along. Uh, is there any questions about that? I don't mind, Cal, if you want to leave this open so people can ask as I go through these agencies. Um, but if you have a question, uh, I won't see you raise your hand. You'll just have to speak up because the screen I'm using blinds me to see. I don't see you anymore. But I'll I also have a question about team. Do you know? Because sure. I'm speaking to a fellow here who's with them at the moment. Um, what do they like it? I've read some of their stuff online, but a lot of the times when you read people's doctrinal statements online nowadays, you, you're not quite sure what you're reading. Um, so what do you yeah. know? Um, what, what do you know about them right now? If you can probably too much to bring into this as a history course. I, I've known team since 1963. I uh, uh, applied with team uh, to the level of not being approved, but uh, getting up to the level of a meeting with them and almost considered coming out here with team. Uh, but then I began to see problems that they had over issues back then and decided that that would be a mistake on my part. Um, um, I, I fellowship very closely with them in Rhodesia. I did their counseling for all of uh, the team missionaries. I counseled team missionaries' wives who were having uh, problems because of the war. Um, you know, so I, I've, 
I, I have great respect for them, but they've continued to compromise. And today they would be considered a new evangelical movement, but they still have their conservative guys. They still have their conservative guys, but they're older men now. I like Chris Goppert and those guys that there's still some around. Uh, but that's probably as much as I should say at this stage that I can tell you we can more. Talk, we can talk some other time now. Sure. Um, uh, if there's anyone else on I've, BMW. I've got a question. Um, maybe this isn't the forum for it, but if you wanted to, um, would you maybe speak to the uh, purpose of uh, mission agency, uh, seeing as there's not maybe uh, that much exposure in, in South African churches. Right. I'd be glad to. Uh, I'll make it brief and sort of make it a one, two, three, if you don't mind. Uh, so the first thing I would say is mission agencies have a history in the missionary movement of the 19, uh, 19th century and early 20th century. And uh, they... Um, were formed very much around men like Moffat and Livingston and Judson and uh, so forth, uh, missionaries to China, missionaries here to Africa. And the, they were societies and they were formed because the denominations would not cooperate. They were too Calvinistic or they were too apathetic or too dead in general for whatever reason. And so these societies grew up uh, out of uh, a concern for evangelism. Then as they migrated to America in the 20th century, and so I'll now jump to the second point, they uh, had started to become more denominational agencies. Um, and uh, so now the denominations that wouldn't have missionary agencies now did have missionary agencies under the name of their denomination. People like Team and AF stayed as interdenominational missions, so they carried on with their earlier uh, positions, uh, pre-World War II positions for sure, uh, most of them going into the 30s. Um, and then uh, the next uh, denominational type missionaries that were coming out here, uh, were coming to South Africa, coming all over the place, uh, uh, existed um, throughout the world, uh, I would say right up until the 70s, uh, 1970s. Uh, they still operate. The Southern Baptist Convention has its convention uh, uh, ministry here, and um, it's changed names. It's gone through some various morphing, but it's basically a Southern Baptist uh, outreach. Denomina de denominationally financed. The big difference is with the denominational finances, you don't go out and raise support by faith from church to church. Instead, you are salaried and the money comes into the denominational pot. They assign you to one place or another. Uh, they move you from one place to another if they need to. Uh, and you have a retirement program and they retire you when they're good and ready. Uh, that didn't suit me. And uh, so then uh, uh, that's the second phase. The third phase would have been the independent Baptist. And most of them started uh, due to World War II. Uh, there's, there's very little before that. Um, there's a little bit of work before that, but very little. Uh, and most of the cases of these missionaries were these were independent missionaries who had been soldiers in World War II. They knew about the Philippines, they knew about uh, Asia Minor, they knew about North Africa, and they went back, uh, now that they were born again soldiers, they went back as missionaries. And that was the surge of missions in the 1950s. Uh, uh, of all these soldiers who'd been spread around the world and they now going back and giving their lives to save the souls of the people they were once fighting in their land. Uh, then by the 60s and 70s, the Bible colleges started producing at least one third of all their graduates were missionary. And these missionaries went all over the world by the tens of thousands. 
uh, in the 80s, 90s, in that period. Um, and uh, so that's basically it. The, the independent Baptists are different in that each missionary goes and raises his support and the, from churches who individually support him, he'll be sent from maybe his home church uh, officially and then 10 to 20 or 30 other churches will join with that uh, home church and they, they use the mission agency as a uh, clearing house, if I can call it that, to find it, to clear their funding, but also to establish doctrinal continuity and also uh, to make sure uh, that they maintain moral integrity uh, on the field and ethical integrity on the field. So those are what, what we're talking about right now. Uh, I'll go past those three points uh, pretty quick. Uh, Baptist international missions um, uh, um, incorporated, that's the last I, uh, comes out of Tennessee Temple, which was a university. It doesn't exist anymore, uh, but it uh, was a, a very strong independent Baptist movement, had a lot of Southern Baptist influence on it as well because of its location, because of its cooperation with conservative Southern Baptists. And, uh, but it was an independent mission, independent Baptist mission technically. And uh, people like Roger McCrum were some of the first to come out, but many came out under that name. Um, but I, I won't try to bring in all the names at this stage, though we'll get into it later. Uh, the mark of BIMI would have been a very traditional conservative independent Baptist evangelistic ministries um, and uh, a very strong pastoral leadership because they're a Southern church. Whenever you find Southern United States, by that you have the Northern United States and the Southern part of the United States. The Southern United States uh, culturally want a very strong pastoral leader. And so these missionaries not only were strong themselves, but they trained their men to be strong pastoral leaders. And the deacons were seen more as um, sort of a secondary uh, role players, assistants to the pastor, not in control of the church in any way. The church was uh, very much a one-man show uh, run by the pastor. And that, of course, uh, from the northern church perspective was not the right way to do it. So there was a difference in uh, concept of uh, the Baptist concept of having one pastor who was the central pastor. You could have as many pastors as you want, but you'd have one who would be the sort of uh, leader of the, of the church uh, in the north. Uh, you had the deacons of the church um, far more in control of the church and the pastor uh, would be employed uh, by them uh, or through them by the church. Uh, so a different approach. Then I'm going to move on to independent faith mission uh, that would have represented uh, Mark Brings, who was the first one to come. We were right on his heels. So Judy and I were independent faith mission out of North Carolina. At that time, though, it was out of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, it moved to Greensboro uh, while we were on the field. And uh, uh, Independent Faith Mission was uh, originally a Bible church mission. It has its roots in Italy, uh, where they were uh, uh, an independent, uh, non-denominational church uh, trying to convert Roman Catholics. And uh, then it grew out of that little uh, sort of beginning. Um, it, it split into two missions. Actually, three came out of it eventually. Uh, all one independent faith, independent gospel. Uh, the Kilmers are, I think, under independent gospel in, uh, in Natal, uh, I think. Um, and so that would have been, uh, and the difference would have been Independent Faith Mission did not at that time want to uh, have nationals receiving uh, 
salaries from churches. They wanted it all to go through the churches, through the missionary, and through the local church here in South Africa or whatever country they were in, where gospel, independent gospel was happy to employ regular missionaries, but they were also ready to employ South Africans or Indian or wherever they were working. Uh, they would employ national pastors uh, directly through churches. So a church in America would pay the salary um, of a pastor in India who was working in an area where the, the, the churches couldn't give him a living wage. Um, so the two different philosophies back then. I doubt if there's much issue anymore between them uh, on those subjects. I think they still operate slightly differently, but uh, there was no doctrinal difference. Uh, they were Bible church, uh, leaning toward interdenominational type congregations or community churches. They were basically Baptistic in their doctrine. Then uh, any questions about independent faith? Just so you know, the reason why Judy and I left independent faith when we came to South Africa was because out of our respect for Mark Grings, who operated a type of sort of a, a more of a brethren style uh, uh, or independent community church style uh, church where we wanted to be more clearly Baptistic. And so instead of causing conflict, uh, we joined the Association of Baptists just so there was not uh, any uh, sliding of Mark Brings, who was in the country first. And, and we so loved him and respected him. That's why we did it. Um, ABWE, Association of Baptists for World Evangelism, had its beginnings in the Philippines. Uh, and then it grew and expanded. It was a part of the uh, the GARBC, the General Association of Regular Baptist Churches, which was a break off in the North from the Northern or American Baptist churches in the North. And um, it was uh, uh, initiated around the Philadelphia area, then New Jersey, and now uh, over near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania today. Um, uh, ABWE uh, was one of four GARBC, General Association of Regular Baptists, approved missionary agencies. That meant they didn't control the agency. It was an independent agency, uh, but it was approved by them, meaning that the churches who were a member of their fellowship would look upon these four mission agencies as agencies that agreed doctrinally with the General Association of Regular Baptists. The General Association of Regular Baptists, like all Northern Baptists, was always divided between Calvinistic tendencies and non-Calvinistic tendencies. And, and that's still true today. So uh, in the South, it used to be they were mostly non-Calvinistic with some Calvinistic tendencies floating around. But in the North, it was a straight split and uh, different times of history, different, uh, the, the split might go 60-40 or 40-60 uh, in history, uh, but that was the Association of Baptists. We joined them in 1980 uh, when we came to South Africa from Zimbabwe. Um, and Dr. Hopewell, some of you know him, uh, was our not only personal friend, but he became a co-worker here in the Cape when he retired. He first came to Natal, then he came to the Cape working with us here uh, and uh, uh, was a great, he and his wife were a great influence on the early days uh, here in the Cape. Then the Baptist Bible Fellowship International uh, comes into play. Um, you notice I've been saying where they're located, Georgia, Tennessee, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. That's that G-A-T-N-N-C-P-A. This is Missouri. 
Now, my family's from Missouri. My father's from Missouri. My wife's from Missouri. Uh, well, she's really an Arkansas girl that got lost in Missouri. But anyway, uh, that's Central South America. Missouri is an interesting state because the young people in Missouri during the Civil War fought each other. One brother would fight for the North and one brother would fight for the South. They're very stubborn people. When I was told that the Afrikaans people were quite stubborn, it didn't even faze me because I was from Missouri and figured I was far more a mule than anybody in this country. And I believe that's still true. Uh, so when someone says, do you find the Afrikaans person to be in any way difficult? I just think, no, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. And it's because those of us from Missouri are, are rather stubborn lot. Anyway, the Baptist Bible Fellowship is focused there. Their Bible college was there. Their headquarters were there. They formed in the 60s. Uh, they come out of the Southern Baptist as the background of that fellowship. There's another group similar to them that has at times operated here in South Africa, the World Baptist Bible Fellowship. Uh, and it's a breakoff group out of Texas. And the difference is that group believes that the Baptist church is the bride of Christ. Um, the Baptist Bible Fellowship probably has a few people in it that believe that too. I don't know if there's anybody left, but um, anyway, um, the big difference in the Baptist Bible Fellowship Church and the Association of Baptists, you would see it in the Baptist Bible Fellowship would teach uh, for a strong Southern style pastoral leader and deacons who were uh, helpers. Uh, the Association of Baptists would teach the deacons ought to be the leaders in the church, along with the pastor, very much on sort of a mutuality or a cooperative basis. Uh, big difference, really. And uh, so the more Southern BBF style, uh, of course, a lot of BBF churches aren't from the South anymore because many Southerners went North because the industry in America is in the North. So if they wanted to work in factories, most of the factories in history were being built in the North. And so many Baptist Bible Fellowship churches, even Southern Baptist churches are found in the North now because so many of the Southern people moved North to get jobs. Um, at any rate, the Baptist Bible Fellowship uh, would be people like Jeff Blanton and uh, oh many others, uh, Clarks and others. There's uh, been a good dozen who've come out here. We've known them all to some degree, went to college with a few of them, and uh, so we understand their background. I did go to Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, where I first attended, and uh, uh, because I didn't always agree with them, I transferred to a seminary in Pontiac, Michigan, uh, uh, because I, it just got too heavy for me. They were very much King James only. They had a lot of Baptist brightism floating around back in those days. And of course, they teach closed communion, meaning that only people who are members of a local church can take communion in that church. So if you're visiting, like if I would visit my father-in-law's church, because my father-in-law was a Baptist Bible Fellowship pastor, uh, if my wife and I would visit his church and they were having communion, we weren't given communion because we weren't a member of their church. So that's closed communion. Uh, and uh, so enough said about them. Let's move on. The, the local independent USA churches also have sent out many um, as the church acting as a sending organization. So instead of using BMW, BIMI, IFM, ABWE, or BBFI, the church just does it themselves. Now, usually that means the church is fairly large. Uh, like when I left ABWE, 
I just ask my church to send me. So I am now sent by the church I was a member of. That's, that's pretty common. Um, it's certainly not a large percentage, though. I, I would think the percentage ought to be under 20% of all missionaries and probably lower, probably lower than that. Uh, who are sent straight from their churches, but I don't have any figures on that. I know there are hundreds and maybe thousands of us out there uh, today. Um, but the reason for that is unhappiness with these agencies becoming too uh, assertive, too uh, controlling, um, um, compromising on issues so instead of fooling with it anymore they just go back to the local church and the local church sends them here in south africa uh, in my opinion our missionary approach is uh, very weak uh, because we don't have any uh, clear cooperation but it's strong because we do have a lot of actual cooperation. Uh, it's not very clear how it all happened, uh, but it does happen. And so uh, most of our missionaries, if not all, are, are sent uh, from their local church here um, in South Africa, throughout South Africa, or even to other countries. Um, and it, it's working for us. And I, I just it's, it's not the American model. It's not the British model. You're going to have to call it the South African model because it does work. It may have some problems, but so do they. All these agencies have a slew of problems. So um, we'll um, leave it there maybe for discussion. Um, GFA is Gospel Fellowship Association. It is an, uh, an agency that came out of Bob Jones University. It was located on the campus for years. Now it's just up the road in a, uh, a building that uh, has been built on property owned originally by Bob Jones. Um, most of the missionaries have graduated from Bob Jones, but not all. Uh, we had very good fellowship with them. Uh, when our children went back to America, on, on, we went back on our furlough, a GFA paid for our children to go to their Christian school there at Bob Jones. Uh, we never paid the fee, GFA did. So we've really had good fellowship with those guys. Um, uh, then, of course, uh, Tony Payne and others came out because I was an ABWE missionary who they considered ABWE to be too compromising and considered me to be compromising, then there was no fellowship between us. And uh, GFA missionaries uh, would not fellowship with ABWE missionaries, um, uh, hardly at all or not at all. And that's relaxed maybe slightly some now, it's a good thing. Uh, Evangelical Baptist Missions, I've mentioned, uh, would have been the mission that the Jacksons uh, came out under and many others, uh, Maurer and, and uh, all the rest, of, uh, most of them, though, focusing only in two places. One would be Rhonda Bosch to Table, uh, table uh, View, uh, somewhere in between there, and then up in Natal, um, almost into Transkei on the uh, on the road out of Natal to Transkei, they've also had ministries up there, um, and uh, so Evangelical Baptist Missions uh, had two main centers that I'm aware of, and uh, uh, it has it did close uh, as a mission. Um, primarily uh, over a philosophy where it felt like missionaries like myself were paid too much money. And uh, of course, we weren't paid anything other than what the churches gave us, but they still didn't like um, the uh, standard that we lived at. And they thought missionaries should live on a lesser stipend. And so they had a regulation that kept their missionaries making smaller salaries than the rest of us. And, you know, that was their belief that 
they'd send out more missionaries with less money. Uh, what actually happened was most of their missionaries did not stay on the field for very long. They couldn't afford to live here. And, um, and in other countries, it was even worse than here. And so they had a massive turnover of missionaries uh, due to uh, financial constraints on these families. And uh, many times uh, we have helped uh, evangelical Baptist missionaries uh, ourselves uh, just because they were so poorly supported. Um, and uh, so they closed. Uh, Maranatha Baptist Mission has never operated uh, down here, but it did operate uh, in Gauteng or Transvaal and a little bit over in the Eastern Cape, uh, which you men have already referred to that. Um, and then uh, Baptist World Mission, which became sort of a dominant uh, party in the Calvary Baptist College or Calvary Baptist Bible College uh, up in um, the uh, I think Primrose area, or, no, no, not Primrose. Uh, anyway, it slipped my mind, Sunnyvale. Uh, so they were up around Sunnyvale uh, working there in, uh, in uh, sort of south eastern Johannesburg. And uh, there's still some men there. Others came, worked different areas, um, and some down to the Eastern Cape. Right now, I don't know how many is in the country, but I would just take a guess of two or three. Uh, and these uh, mostly come out of the South. Maranatha men come out of the South. They're all usually very anti-Calvinistic and they are very King James only. They would consider themselves fundamentalists. I used to consider myself a fundamentalist, but fundamentalism, in my opinion, rather died on the vine. And so it's a word that I, I would use only as a historic term. I, I don't think it means anything here in South Africa anyway. So uh, there's the review that I wanted to do. I've allowed, I hope, enough time for you to ask questions about them. So. I'm gonna leave it up on the screen and let people, or should I close it? Cal, what do you think? I think you can leave, leave it up on the screen. Okay. And, uh, then we can just refer to that as we go along. And, and I can also answer questions if you want uh, uh, about the uniqueness of the Cape in, in just maybe five minutes, okay? Sure. So I'm, I'm gonna get into that, but I get into it next week too. Okay. All right, any questions, guys? Pastor Dean, I see your mic's on. Yeah, yeah I did have a quick question. The church in Hillbrow, I, I know that uh, guys like Ruben Bay, who's the current pastor there now, but these guys like Hesman, I think his name was Tom Hesman, I'm not sure. And then I think, yeah. if memory serves me well, David the Brain, they sort of had a connection to that church. Who started the Hillbrow church in, a, in and among these pastors and, and mission agencies that you spoke about? I, I'm going to give, I might be wrong, but I'm going to give credit to Joel Baines, okay? And, uh, but there was a group of men who went through there at such a pace, uh, I can't tell you who they all were. It might have been uh, Lou Finney who actually started it. Um, uh, and he was out of an a independent church out of Chicago. Um, uh, Joel would have been B-I-M-I, -I, I believe. I hope I'm right. Um, and um, then, uh, yeah, I've been to the church a few times. I've spoken there over the years a couple of times, but I, I really don't have a, a deep understanding of, of that ministry. Um, I know about it more back when it first was being formed in the uh, early 70s. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. I wish I knew more than what I'm telling you, but that uh, I would have, I, I, I credit it to Lou and to, and to Joel. Any other questions before we go back on? It's, it's not a question, but it was an observation. So 
um, over the many years. And I, I'm, I mean, my, my question really comes from, 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 from kind of two understandings, ABWE and EBM, because I, I had the privilege to, 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 uh, to, to be taught and mentored by missionaries from both those organizations. But an observation was that um, sometimes missionaries would be sent by these two boards and that organizations, and when they arrived in South Africa, they were not actually ready for ministry. And, and, and I kind of go, but why did the church, why did the organization send them in the first place? How did they assist those missionaries to come over here to be part of a team? And, and when the folks arrived here, they just were not ready for ministry. Uh, just your comment on that. Well, you know, I guess I'll make a brief comment. I'll, I'll, I'll give a quote. Uh, Paul Sager told me that he wanted me to train him in how to plant a church how to um, uh, grow a church, and how to do counseling uh, and discipleship. Yeah. And, and I said, well, you know, let's start with what did you learn in college? You know, I, I just, because I learned about those things in college, okay? The colleges I went to, with all the faults they might have had, they still did teach me the basics. He said, well, basically, we didn't learn anything. Uh, Paul's parents had been missionaries, Joan's parents had been missionaries, but they had been sent away to boarding schools most of their lives, so they didn't watch their parents do it, they weren't with their parents except on holiday, so they didn't know much of that, and they went to Bible college, and they were taught the Bible, and frankly, they were taught the Bible very well, uh, there'd be like Appalachian Bible College, taught very well, um, but they didn't know how to plant churches because that wasn't the emphasis of those colleges. Those colleges were teaching the Bible. They weren't even teaching theology. So when I later started teaching a theology class, Paul and, and Frank and um, uh, I think maybe might have been uh, Wilson's, wanted to attend it because they had never been taught theology and they'd never heard of, uh, uh, you know, so much of the different views of theology like neo-orthodoxy and new evangelicalism. They just didn't know about those things. So again, it showed that the Bible college model uh, had flaws. When it comes to how they came out, they came out because they wanted to come. Uh, there's a great scripture verse in Paul's writings to Timothy when he says that if you desire the work of a bishop, you desire a good thing. And, and so they wanted to be pastors, and, and they desired to do it, and they were morally qualified, they were ethically qualified, and they had a vision for lost souls. They wanted to evangelize people, and then when they got here, they realized, uh-oh, I have to plan a church. No one told me how to do that. I have to organize a church. Nobody told me how to do that. I have to train pastors. Nobody told me how to do that. Uh-oh. Uh, and yeah, it, it, it's a bit of an embarrassing story. I'm very I'll leave it. For that. Uh, I'm very thankful for that answer. You won't believe how much. I, I'm extremely thankful for that answer. It, it, it helps to put a lot of things in perspective and give me peace in my heart on many things. So thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Uh, look, these are guys who they uh, they they love the Lord. They love lost souls, and the people who equip them fail them. So, and that's why I've had such a strong ministry with so many of these people, because I was willing to help assist them. And that's one that's, of the reasons why I appreciate you. Well, I know that, listen, I know I, that you, I'm starting, I know a, that you did I'm many starting things a, behind the scenes. I'm starting a club of people who appreciate me. If you want to be the chairman, we can start with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, may, may I add a question quickly? Yes, uh, okay. So okay. don't plan on many dues being paid, by the way. No, 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 no. I'll, yeah. I'll veto that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. veto. I have a question. I've got a question. Yes, uh, uh, if 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 we, we have all these um, uh, American missionaries that have come out, or these missionaries that have come out, and, and came out under, under mission boards, 
yeah. why has that uh, philosophy of 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 organizing uh, into a mission board not transcended into the South African context? In other words, we have a lot of South African missionaries, but mm-hmm. but we've not really adopted the the idea of a mission board in South Africa. I give you uh, two it, reasons. It, yeah, okay. I give you two reasons. One reason. When you look around at these boards and look at what a mess they are, you wouldn't know which one to copy. Then second, there's a reality of the fact that when you teach people to build their churches around the New Testament, there's no mention of that kind of thing. So the idea of these associations and these sending agencies is an idea that comes out of primarily England and Germany in the 1880s, 1860s, 1850s, and went over to America, got picked up, organized. Um, It's just, and I don't think you'll find that most of us missionaries would want to recommend which one of them you should use as a model. If you said, do I think you use Baptist World, Maranatha, Evangelical, Gospel Fellowship, BBF, Association of the World. Look, I have combined, I've got some connection with every mission board up there, except maybe Baptist International. All right. I've served and worked with every one of those agencies. I've served and worked with Team and AEF. Um, And if you said, which one would I recommend? (laughs) I would say, I don't know. I would get shy and, and, and drop my head because I don't have an answer to that. Uh, they're here. They're doing what they're doing. They usually don't talk to each other very well. Uh, they they know the word independent. They don't know the word interdependent. Uh, thank you, sir. So, so we're not really in a bad space necessarily. Uh, so, you might be, uh, but you're uh, not in their bad space. You're in your own. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to let Thank you off the hook. I, I, I don't know the answer to this question, so I'm not going to pretend I do. Okay. Yeah. And you're not letting us off lightly either. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. But, you know, I just lost a number member, another member to my fan club. What am I going to do? Yeah. Uh, all right. Can we go on? I've got just a few minutes. I want to introduce sure. this next section. Uh, I'm not going to try to complete it because I've got five weeks to complete it, but I wanted to introduce it. And, and that is, I want to explain there's a uniqueness to the Cape that if you stop and look around at vision and action, the learning ministry team that existed here for a long time, sorry about spelling on your name, Sean, Um, the Cape Church Ministries Institute. I'm going to have to start writing these things with my glasses on. Uh, We have our missionaries going out. We have uh, our various uh, uh, sort of uh, local church Bible schools, Bible college, I'll call them Bible colleges, um, like Lintagir and and Macassar and and Grace and, and TVG all have their own versions of this and maybe others that I'm not thinking of. Good Hope Christian School uh, uh, and its roots in the learning ministry team and BIA and Divorce and Cropsies and Rudolphs and, uh, and others of us. PMR, um, the camping ministry, Herald of Hope, uh, Helios, uh, a newer uh, thing. And there's other things even newer than Helios that have been added to it. I just bring them in to talk about the fact that how this happened, I wanted you to know how it happened in these last five minutes. And then we'll talk about them more in detail if you want later. How it happened that here in the Cape, um, we have this great cooperation and and, uh, fellowship among missionaries in, in a broad sense. Uh, came about because of a general respect that I had and Dave Rudolph had and Dave DeVore had for all these agencies. 
You see, a lot of reason why people don't trust uh, another missionary agency is, is because they know it has a peculiar distinctive or a particular style that they don't agree with. Now, I would, on that basis, say I probably disagree with every one of them on something. But that was true of my mother and I, too. So what's new? Uh, so very important to say that uh, what we did decide is that we believed in interdependency and we believed in the unity of the spirit and we believed we could accomplish a lot even when we disagreed with each other. Now, many of the, the, in, the agencies were, were teaching a mistrust to people like I could tell you what's wrong with the Baptist Bible Fellowship International because I was trained under the Baptist Bible Fellowship International, or I could tell you about their strengths. Uh, Sean uh, just mentioned at the beginning of the earlier session, one of the Baptist Bible Fellowship strengths, and he didn't know he did it, but he did, when he said, this new family has come to Christ and they have brought a lot of vigor or a lot of excitement to this little church he's in. The Baptist Bible Fellowship believes that the primary goal of the church is evangelism. And that if you're evangelizing and leading people to Christ, most of your other issues, problems, or differences will be minimums. They won't go away. They still have to be dealt with, but they will not become as huge as they would be if you focused on those problems instead of evangelism. So what Sean testified to, the Baptist Bible Fellowship considers to be a philosophical statement that they believe the local church ought to evangelize first, foremost, above everything else. And uh, so because of that, I, I might uh, think that's a very good statement, or I might have my own view uh, that that's imbalanced. And there has to be another possibility or two that we would have to put some other things in there. But what I've taught is a love for the Baptist Bible Fellowship, a love for what they're doing right, for what they're standing for, and so my view is that the Baptist Bible Fellowship or my brothers in Christ and the, uh, and the BIMI guys are my brothers in Christ and Roger McCrum and Bill Mayers and these are godly men and they are to be respected and loved. And if we disagree on some things, then we do. But we don't have to disagree to the point that we uh, can't uh, work together for the benefit of the local churches that we serve, and we can work together without becoming an association or a fellowship of pastors or a, a identifiable body. It, it's just we can do it because we love each other, you know. Uh, yeah, I know my wife and I have a contract of marriage called a marriage certificate, but it doesn't keep us together. Uh, we have a lot in common, but that doesn't keep us together. What keeps us together is our absolute commitment to the good of the other person. She is interested in my good, and I'm interested in her good before the Lord. So that's what I believe is what created an atmosphere between Dave Rudolph Dave DeVore, myself, Mr. Waugh Sr. joined us. He had that approach, of course, because he had been in my church up in Rhodesia, and, and he had heard that philosophy there. And others joined over the years. You can see some of the names. John Jackson was very cooperative, but he left the country, and so forth and so on. So, so there's been plenty of fellowship around this idea. There have been those who couldn't do it. There are those who wouldn't do it. But still, you can see a lot was accomplished by an effort to cooperate together. I believe we can cooperate because we already have 
we already have um, uh, a, a, a strength that is very, very important. Uh, and that is, we are doctrinally basically agreed. So I will stop my sharing and I'll hand it back to Cal. Thank you, Pastor Mark. Uh, another interesting uh, lesson. And uh, thank you for sharing your heart. And uh, thank you for what you did and fostered in this country um, in so many different ways and your rich knowledge of all of these different mission boards, etc., and interacting with these men. And as you rightly say, uh, it's for the good of the ministry um, going forward. And that has certainly impacted all of us that are here today. Um, these different missionaries and you didn't let those sideline you and just limit you. So I thank the Lord for the vision that he gave you and uh, your love for us, uh, love for souls, and uh, also for your love of history and keeping the records for us uh, of all of yeah. this. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, well, you, uh, can, you, you can see I'm not a detailed person. That's why Albert's going to call me and yeah. give me the right dates. A lot of yeah. times my, my dates are the date when the church organized, not the date when it started. And then the other place, yeah. it's when it started and not when it organized. So I, I'm, I'm maintaining my standard of being inconsistent. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. it. We love you for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but, well, uh, a good historian would do better than I'm doing. So whoever yeah. wants to follow me, let me know. Okay. I see. Liam, did you want to say something? Brother, I saw you were on earlier. Oh, yeah. No, um, I just maybe, maybe Sean could uh, say something about the time uh, the people from Bob Jones University in America came to visit. Uh, Community Baptist Church in Middletown. Oh yeah, well yeah, well we have a we sort of have a working relationship with a group of young men and their sports coach. Who are they go to you know, Bob Jones University? So um, they plan to come in May again next year, Liam. Oh, well, that's um, nice. That that's so, yeah. another thing that I didn't mention, but uh, you're quite right. We've had many college teams come out here and help us with our camps and with other things. So, um, uh, by the way, well, and you just sent me a question. Is that for tomorrow or next week? Uh, while I have everyone here, they've actually asked me to consider if I would take a team from Bob Jones with their coach and a man called Dan Bowers and bring them to South Africa. So um, I've spoken to Dion about that, but they're thinking about not, not 2020 to 2023. So Dan Bowers, if you remember, there was a, there was a man, Bowers, who was shot down by the Peruvian Air Force. Uh, yeah, was with, yeah. with they, that this is his brother. We've become really good friends. He's, we, we love one another. We, we talk maybe once a week. And so they bring in a, they bring a sports team. They, bring a, they play soccer, basketball, golf. Um, you know, they'll do camps, they'll do whatever you want, but that's something to think about because, and, and they're eager to bring, bring a team. So they're going to come next May to me, but they want to come to South Africa and start. So if you guys have work for them, let me know and we can start talking about that. That's another mission agency, by the way, that you can be thankful for called MAF, Missionary Aviation Fellowship. Aviation Fellowship. Uh, they work in many countries and, and they fly missionaries places they couldn't go otherwise. And we used to use them up in Zimbabwe. But yeah. And, and, and the work that uh, Ted, Ted Weinberg and them do, is that formalized under a mission board as well? Is it, you know, that, that, was under, that was under ABWE. Okay, okay. Yeah, but it's also formalized through churches like Friendship Baptist. Uh, there's a church down in Florida. There's a, two churches in Florida. Mark had a group come out of a ministry. Uh, yeah, where was yeah. it? St. Petersburg, Mark? I don't remember. But yeah. yeah. So th th they're different kinds. Um, okay. Coming out and helping build, helping do. Yeah. Mm. But those are usually independent. And, and now mm. Weinbergs weren't, but, but many are. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Even GRBC has got uh, uh, 
helping teams that send they send out. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. There's all. There's just so many. There, yeah. there are literally hundreds of these groups. Yeah, yeah, and, and going I mean, all around the world. The mission agency I'm with, um, they will send you know building teams. Um, you know, say if you guys are um, happy to ever get involved in a building project again, um, like just this man will take the holidays, much like the guys who built Mountain View and the and the Paderberg um, Mountain Retreat. So we have an arm that does that too, and they're just eager to help. This COVID has sort of put a dampen on some of the yeah things. on everything, hasn't it? Yeah. Well, I'm going to thank you all. Thank you for. Thank you listening thank uh, you very much you're going to find that the future sessions we have not just the q a coming up but all the future sessions are going to be relatively informal where we can converse and and discuss different aspects of the ministry you can look ahead you can also watch my websites i'm posting some of the previous talks that went by earlier the text i'm giving you the text of those talks and this list of um, uh, churches, I, I will be posting that on one of them, but I'm going to make a few corrections first, so it won't be this week. But this week, there will be some things going up from two weeks ago, so you can check the websites uh, if you'd like for, for other additional, but it's mostly what you've heard already. <coughs> Thanks, is, Philip LaRue, uh, is Philip LaRue about to leave the country? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Two weeks time, yes. Two weeks time. Uh, I wonder if, uh, if uh, someone would just close our time in prayer, praying for Philip and Amy in their ministry uh, for the next six months or so. Yeah. Sure. I'll close us. All right. Thank you all. Uh, been an exciting day. Let's pray as we close. Father, thank you. Thank you for the history of the churches in South Africa, and thank you for Pastor Mark uh, being so diligent in keeping these records. And um, Lord, as we consider all that has been done, uh, sometimes just looking at each individual ministry, it seems like so little has been accomplished. But when we put this all together in the way that you've shown us this morning, we can see your hand at work in so many areas in our country and uh, we do thank you for that we thank you for every single missionary that has come out and contributed to planting churches that believe in your word and are still standing strong today in their faith in your word and in practice and uh, so we we thank you for our churches that we're all involved in and pray that you continue to lead us and to guide us and that we would stand firm, we would be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord in some way, shape, or form, knowing that our toil is not in vain in the Lord. Father, I thank you for Pastor Philip and Amy and little Zane as uh, they embark on deputation now to raise support in the States for the next six months. And I thank you for their desire to come back to South Africa to continue serving alongside us at Faith Fellowship and to continue to plant the, the work in the churches, in the townships of uh, for Santa Kral and Blukumbos. At this moment in time, Lord, we thank you for uh, the building operation that we're going to be starting next year there. And uh, Lord, it's exciting. And I pray that you'd bless them, encourage them, strengthen them along the way that they keep looking to you, trusting in you, knowing that you go before, but you also go with us in all that we are doing. So Lord, um, bless our services tomorrow, and might we continue to shine the light of your word uh, brightly, and uh, to teach our people, to train them, and uh, to look for that next generation of pastors, missionaries, evangelists, uh, Sunday school teachers, and those that uh, are, will continue to have an impact in the lives of South Africans for many, many years till you return. So we thank you for this day. Bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. All right. Thank, thank you. God bless.